This is ADTV. Brought to you by Amazing Discoveries. Um, tonight, as you see on the screen, our subject is very an interesting name, and that is liar, lunatic, or lord. And um, some of you may be wondering, where is this guy going with this? The Bible has something very interesting to say in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. In fact, Bible expositors have called this chapter the chapter of faith. It is all about faith, men and women of the Old, and Old Testament especially, who exercised faith and did incredible things with God. And um, there are many today in the world also who say that faith is something that comes by feeling. Has anyone ever heard that before? That if you feel a certain way, then, then you have faith. So there is a movement, even in, within Christendom today, that is pushing people to have a certain uh, a, a feeling to have faith. But I'd like to read to you what the Word of God says in Hebrews 11, verse 1, perhaps the clearest, most concise definition in the entirety of the Bible on what faith truly is. The Bible says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So, friends, let me ask you a question tonight. What is faith based on, according to Hebrews 11, verse 1? Is it based on our feelings? Is it based on our emotions? Is it based on what our, our mother or father believed? No. The Bible says that faith is based upon evidence, right? So is there such a thing in the Christian world as having blind faith, yes or no? There isn't because the Bible says there is, it has to be based on what? Evidence. Now, for example, if someone is, how do you say, brought to a trial, if they were accused of being a, a criminal, there, ha there has to be sufficient evidence in order to prosecute that person, correct? So in order for us to understand the faith of Christ, we need to find out the evidence in which we can base our faith on. Does that make sense? 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16 through 19 says something very, very interesting. The Bible tells us here, Peter is writing and he says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were what? Eyewitnesses of his majesty. So Peter, he actually saw, what did he see? He saw who? He saw Christ. He saw the Lord, right? So he was an eyewitness of Jesus. And um, it's very, very fascinating. And what else did Peter say? They did not follow what? Cunningly devised fables. So what, Jesus, what Peter was saying is we didn't follow just any story. Well, the Bible says very clearly that they were eyewitnesses of His majesty. But friends, this isn't the most important thing. I want you to continue looking on the screen with me. Verse 17 says, For He received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to Him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven, we what? Heard when we were with Him in the Holy Mount. So first of all, what, did they, first of all, what did, were they associated with Jesus? They were what? Eyewitnesses, right? And here Peter says they also heard with their own ears the voice from God the Father, correct? So they saw with their eyes, they heard with their ears, but the next portion is the most important. But notice what he says. We have also a more sure word of what? Prophecy. So friends, what does this tell us about the importance of prophecy? 
It tells me as a Bible-believing Christian that prophecy is more important than what we see or what we hear because, friends, guess what? Let me tell you something. Your senses can fool you. Your senses can fool you. In fact, there are many people today who even say, and I'll be showing you this in a future lecture, that they have seen Jesus on earth. But friends, that's not according to the Bible. It's not according to the Bible. So that we must be sure what we believe is according to the Scripture. Because today in our day and age, what has happened is people have lofted emotional spirituality above the plain teachings of the Word of God. I've even heard people say, they've said, listen, I don't need the Bible. For, I don't need it. I just need what the Spirit says to me. Now, let me ask you a question about the Bible. Would the Holy Spirit tell you something that is not, or is not, was, isn't congruent with what the Bible says? Would the Holy Spirit tell you something like that? No. The Holy Spirit must reveal things to you that are in harmony with the Bible. Now, how can I say that? Well, 2 Peter 1.21 tells us that the Bible was inspired by men of God who were inspired by the what? Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit, friends, and the, 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 the feelings and the emotions that we have, they must be in harmony with each other. Or if not, we might be treading on dangerous ground. So this, this evening, we're going to talk about Jesus historically, who he was. And I'll just read to you here this statement. It's very, very uh, compelling. And it says, regardless of what anyone may personally think or believe about him, Jesus of Nazareth has been the dominant figure in the history of Western culture for almost 20 centuries. If it were possible with some sort of super magnet to pull up out of that history every scrap of metal bearing his name, how much would be left? It is from his birth that most of the human race dates its calendars. It is by his name that millions curse, and it is in his name that millions pray. This was penned by Yaroslav Pelikan, who is a historian about um, the Bible. And that's a very compelling point, isn't it? That even if people don't believe in Jesus, they use his name on frequent occasion when they curse him, right? If you turn on your television, you hear God's name taken in vain quite often if you're watching normal television. It's very interesting that many of the other gods, you'll find their names aren't taken in, in, in vain like Jesus is. That's, that's very interesting as well. Here's another statement about this man named Jesus. He was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He grew up in another village where he worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30. Then for three years, he was an itinerant preacher. He never held an office. He never had a family or owned a home. He didn't go to college. He never visited a big city. He never traveled 200 miles from the place where he was born. He did none of the things that usually accompany greatness. He had no credentials but himself. He was only 33 when the tide of a public opinion turned against him. His friends ran away. One of them denied him. He was turned over to his enemies and went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. While he was dying, his ex executioners gambled for his garments, the only property he had on earth. When he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. Nineteen centuries have come and gone, and today he is the central figure of the human race. All the armies that have ever marched, all the navies that have ever sailed, all the parliaments that have ever sat, all the kings that have ever reigned put together have not affected the life of man on this earth as much as that one solitary life. Isn't that a compelling statement? One man who had no riches, who didn't go far away from his homeland, but yet he's impacted Western society and the world like no other man. And as we begin this evening, I want to pose to you Three alternatives for every person, every individual on this planet about this man named Jesus. Now these three alternatives can be, they're in, um, how do you say, they are coupled under two larger categories. And we'll look at those categories just now. The first large category is his claims were false.
false. Now we're going to look at two alternatives under this one and then one alternative under his claims were true. Okay? The first alternative is simply this. If his claims were false, number one, he knew that his claims were false. Number two, he intentionally misled. Number three, therefore, he would be a liar. Okay? I'm not up here saying that he was. I'm just saying these are alternatives for us to ponder. Okay? So either he was, uh, claims were false, he was a liar. Okay, the second alternative is he did not know his claims were true. Therefore, that would make him, or he did not know his claims were false. Therefore, that would make him crazy or a lunatic. For example, let's say if I got up here this evening and I told each of you a very incredible new revelation that God revealed to me. And I told you that I have just realized that I was God himself. Okay, let's say I told you that. What would be your first reaction in your mind about me if I said that? What? Crazy. Crazy. This guy has lost his marbles, right? You would think this guy is nuts. So Jesus, many times in his own ministry, claimed that he was God, right? He claimed that. So either what he's saying is true or either Jesus was absolutely insane. Do you follow the train of logic? Okay. All right, now let's take a look at the third alternative in this scenario. Okay, the third alternative is simply this. His claims were true, therefore he is the Lord. There's no other way to around this. There's only three options. Either he was lying about the whole thing. Number two, he was a lunatic. He was crazy. Or number three, he is actually what he said he was, the Lord or God on earth. Okay? So let me just review that for you real, real quickly. Either Jesus was a liar, Jesus either was a lunatic, or Jesus indeed is the Lord, the God of, of heaven. Now, for those that know the Bible and for those who do not know the Bible, I'd like to, to share this with you. Jesus made some incredible claims while on this earth. Many of you know that. One claim that he made was he said that he came down from heaven. Again, if I said that to you this evening, you would say, all right, we need to call the nearest authorities to take care of this young man, right? You would say, get rid of him. But Jesus said that he came down from heaven. Jesus also said, if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to John 14 and verse 6. Jesus said that he is the way, the truth, and the life, right? Now, the age in which we live in now is an age in which we all know is a relativistic and pluralistic world. It is not popular to say that someone has the truth, right? It's not a popular thing in our culture to say that. But Jesus goes against the grain of culture by saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He didn't say, I am a way, or I am a truth, but he said, the way and the truth, which means he is the definite truth. Does that make sense so far? Okay. Now, here's a question that I get from many people. How do we know that Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth was a legitimate figure in history? How do we know that Jesus was not just some character that was envisioned by the Bible writers? Okay. Let's take a look at some historical facts besides the Bible that validate the man Jesus Christ in history. The first one we find in a book or by a historian called Eusebius of Caesarea, way back between 283 AD and 371. He wrote that the religion of Jesus Christ is neither new nor strange. So this was, of course, after, way after Jesus came to this earth, 281, uh, 283 to 371. So this was after. Here's another statement from St. Augustine of Hippo. He wrote, This is our day in the Christian religion, not as having been unknown, in, excuse me, not as having been unknown in former times, but as having recently received that name. Basically what he's saying is the name Christian was new, but the Christian religion was there from, from a long time back. The, the, the name Christian didn't come until a little bit later on. Here's another statement um, from Suetonius, the Roman historian in A.D. 120. He said, Since the Jews were continually making disturbances at the instigation of Christus, he, Claudius, expelled them from Rome. So again, we see Jesus mentioned in history, not just biblical history, but secular 
history as well. Uh, the Talmud, the, the, from the Jewish traditions, um, says the following, On the eve of the Passover, they hanged Yeshu of Nazareth. So, secular historians tell us very clearly. Here's another one, Tactitus, in the, the Roman historian in 8115. He wrote this, Christus, from whom their name is derived, was executed at the hands of the procurator Pontius Pilate in the reign of Tiberius. So these statements are historically sound. This isn't just from a religious document, but from a secular document as well. So the question arises in our hearts and minds, how can we be sure or how can we identify the true Messiah? There has been many people throughout the, street, throughout the time who have said that they are the Messiah, correct? And we're going to look at quite a few of them on uh, Monday, I believe, or sun, Sunday or Monday, we're going to look at those individuals. It, it is Sunday. Um, it's very fascinating. Even recently, there have been people, and you may have seen this on your local news, that have claimed to be Jesus very recently, and they have thousands of people following them. Very, very odd. Um, here's ta let's take a look at some prophecies about this man, Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that Jesus would be preceded by a messenger. Isaiah 40 and verse 3 says, The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness... Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. That's what the Old Testament said. This was hundreds of years, in fact, thousand years before Jesus walked on the earth in his ministry in Nazareth and in Palestine. Okay, now was this fulfilled? Absolutely. Matthew 3, verses 1 through 3 tells us, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And it goes on saying, For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, this, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And I'm going to go through quite a bit of prophecy tonight, and I'm going to race through it because there's a lot to cover. But it is amazing, friends, that exactly what Isaiah said way back is exactly what Jesus did, fulfilled it precisely. In fact, in John 8.33, um, the Jewish leaders there said, We are Abraham's seed and we're never in bondage to any man. How do you say that we shall be made free? And Jesus, later on, he talked about this a little bit further and amplified on it by saying, My kingdom is not of this world. Now, this was a shock not only to the Jewish um, religious leaders, but it was also a shock to the very disciples that followed Jesus. If you can recall reading the Bible, the the followers of Jesus, they believed that Jesus was going to establish a kingdom on this world, right? They believed that Jesus was here to set up a temporal kingdom on earth. But Jesus said, what? My kingdom is not of this world. And this is very important for us to consider as well. Because as we will see in the lectures to follow, there is a, an incredible movement to start a kingdom down on this world before Jesus comes. And friends, that is not biblical because Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world, correct? Here's another prophecy in Isaiah 7, 14. It says, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. That is a miraculous birth. Now, if it said a young woman would conceive, that wouldn't be too miraculous because that happens every day, right? Young women conceive and have children. In fact, if you read some, of other, some other Bible versions, it actually will say, young woman will have a child. It's very interesting because that isn't too miraculous, you know. But this is miraculous. This shows that, that Jesus had a miraculous birth. And in fact, in Luke it says, the angel said to her, you will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, which means to be saved from sin. The name Jesus means that. Bethlehem, it was actually identified by name where Jesus would be born. It says, Bethlehem, out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel. Now, this is interesting because Jesus, where, does anyone know where Jesus lived his life primarily, where he grew up, where he worked as a young man, what name of the, the city he lived in? Does anyone know? Nazareth, right? Jesus of Nazareth. But where was Jesus born, according to the Bible, what it would say? Bethlehem. So Bethlehem was what the Bible said where Jesus would be born. This was a prophecy. 
But Jesus grew up in Nazareth. But how did this all come about? Well, Matthew 2 verse 1 tells us that Jesus was actually born, like the Bible prophesied, in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king. And the reason why, of course, is there was a decree that went forth to kill all the children under two years old and under. And they went down and escaped, and Jesus was born there in Bethlehem because they went to Egypt and they were coming back and he was born there in Bethlehem. Amazing how the Bible is so accurate. Here is another statement from the Old Testament about, um, about Jesus before. It said, The Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek, good tidings, good news, or the gospel, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, to comfort all that mourn. So this was prophesied about Jesus, and it came to pass exactly as he said it would. Uh, as the book of Luke tells us, exactly Jesus was that person that fulfilled this prophecy. Another prophecy about the ministry of miracles that Jesus would do. In Isaiah 35, it tells us that he would open the eyes of the blind and that the ears of the deaf would be unstopped. Again, this was a thousand years before it took place, and Jesus fulfilled every single prophecy. Matthew 9.35 tells us that he healed all manner of disease and all manner of sickness. So again, we see this repeated. Psalm 78 verse 2 it says that Jesus would open his mouth, in, or it says, I will open my mouth in a parable. And Jesus, how did he teach? He taught by parables, right? Matthew 13 verse 34. Even the manner of the way he would be betrayed was incredibly etched in the Old Testament. Psalm 41.9, it says, Even my close friend whom I trusted, he who shared my bread has lifted up his heel against me. That is what the Bible said would happen. And did it happen, those of you who know the Bible? Yes, it did. The man Judas betrayed Jesus with a kiss. And that's very interesting because the Christian world today is also betraying Jesus with a kiss. And we'll be talking about that in a few more evenings. So they... So this man, Judas, betrayed Jesus with a kiss, just like the Bible prophesied. Even how his body, even how, he was, um, how much he cost as far as being delivered, it tells us in the Old Testament, 30 pieces of silver. And as we look at the New Testament, in Matthew 26, it tells us the same thing, that Judas Iscariot was given 30 pieces of silver to deliver Jesus to them. And there it tells us also in Matthew the same thing, 27. He threw down the silver in the temple, departed, and they took counsel and they buried him in the potter's field. So many, many prophecies. Here's another one, Isaiah 50, verse 6. I offered my back to those who, pulled, who beat me and my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. Isaiah 50 and verse 6. That's pretty hard to guess that would take place, right? It's pretty hard to guess that. If you look in Matthew, did that, is that what happened? Absolutely. It says they spit in his face and they buffeted him, which actually means to punch vigorously. And they smote him with the palms of their hands. Everything was written beforehand. Psalm 69 and verse 4 said they hated Jesus or they would hate the Messiah without a cause. That was fulfilled pr precisely. They hated him without a cause. And we could go on and on. Friends, we could just... There are so many prophecies. There's over 70 prophecies about this. We're not going to do 70. We're going to do just a few. But it's just amazing how God made it so clear for people to understand this. Um, the next verse um, tells us a little bit more details. It says, When he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he did not answer anything. That's a perfect fulfillment of Isaiah 53, verse 7. He was dumb. In other words, he, was, he didn't say anything when he was brought before his death. And he didn't say anything as well when he was brought there. The Bible also says that they would wag their heads at him, and that's exactly what took place in the reality. It's fascinating that it even talks about the crucifixion in the Old Testament. Now, did you know a, a thousand years before Christ that the crucifixion was not a way of death? They used to stone people, right? But even in the Old Testament, it talks about that. Here in the New Testament, it confirms the Old Testament saying that they crucified him. They were numbered with the transgressors. So many prophecies that talk about these very things. They, they will look on me, the one they have pierced. That's in the Old Testament, saying how Jesus would die. He would bear the sins of many. He would 
be an intercessor. He, even on the cross, friends, Jesus was so, uh, such a savior because right there, there was a thief on one side and there were actually two thieves on both sides, but one of them called out to Jesus in faith. He said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom, right? And Jesus said, Surely I make you a promise today. You will be with me in paradise. So even on the cross, Jesus was interceding for the sinners. And Psalm 22, verse 8, describes how they would even take his garments and bet for them or, or, or cast lots for them. It says, They divided my garments among them, and for, their, for my clothing they cast lots. So they did this with Jesus. Psalm, uh, excuse me, John 19 tells us precisely that's exactly what they did. Even when Christ was dying on the cross, Psalm 22 told us beforehand what he would say. He said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that's exactly what Jesus said. Now, does any, it's interesting why people would, why Jesus would say such a thing like that. When Jesus was on earth, did he please God sometimes? All the time, right? Jesus continually pleased God. In fact, if you look in your Bible, John 8, 29, it said, I did always those things that pleased him. So when Jesus was on the cross, what he actually experienced was the complete sin of the entire history of the human race upon him. And he felt separated from God because of the sin that was upon him. And actually, he was separated from God because of the sin that was upon him. Psalm twenty two sixteen tells us, that they pierced my hands and my feet. Again, thousand, a thousand years before the time of Christ. Jesus said, in, or Psalm says that into his hands he would commit, into the Father's hands he would commit his spirit. And that's exactly what he said in Luke 23. Even it says in Psalms that his bones would not be broken whatsoever. And if those of you have studied the sanctuary in the Old Testament, when they took a lamb to sacrifice it, None of, none, of those lamb, none of the lamb's bones were broken, right? That perfectly prefigured Christ. Every single element of his life was there beforehand. It even spoke, speaks about how they did not want to leave his body on the cross on the Sabbath day, how they broke the legs of the other thieves, but they didn't break Jesus' legs because he, he was already dead, correct? He was already dead, so they didn't need to break his legs. And it says, Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. So, incredible. When they came to Jesus, they saw that he was dead already and they didn't break his legs. So all of these details are incredibly written down for us to ponder even now in our day. Now, some skeptics have demanded and they've said, well, you know, that could all be coincidental that Jesus fulfilled these prophecies. That could have been a, a happenstance. That could have been just, you know, a coincidence, a uh, a random act of, of, uh, of the things, how the life's played out. But let's take a look at a very interesting book, and I highly recommend this book, by the way. It's called Evidence That Demands a Verdict by Josh McDowell. It's a, very, it's a very good resource. And he said something very fascinating. He said, Some skeptics have suggested that these prophecies were accidentally or coincidentally fulfilled by Jesus. According to the science of probability, the chance of any one human being up until the present fulfilling a selection of just eight of these prophecies, including the one on the crucifixion, is one in ten to the seventeenth power. Now, if you ponder that number for just a moment, that's a big number, right? One in ten to the seventeenth power. In fact, um, if someone wants to find out how big that number is, you can do that for homework and, and tell us tomorrow. But this is a huge number, one in ten to the power of seventeen. Now, we're just talking here, it says, about eight prophecies. What if we were to consider 48 prophecies? The chance then becomes virtually zero of 1 in 10 to the 157th power. And then there's even more prophecies than that, 61 prophecies. So that's kind of hard for us to get our mind wrapped around. So I want to make it a little bit more plain. What does that look like? How can we explain that to us who don't know of a number so big? Let's suppose that... We take one of you seated here this evening, and we take you to the state of Texas, okay? Has anyone ever been to Texas here? Uh, Texas, pretty big place. Yeah, we have a few. So I take you to Texas and blindfold you, and let's see what we would do. We would blindfold you and take this number, many of silver dollars, and stack them over the entire surface of the state of Texas. 
Now, that would be not just one layer. It would be many layers. In fact, it would be two feet deep of silver dollars. Okay? That's quite a lot of silver dollars. And then we would take just one of those silver dollars and put an X on the silver dollar. And then after that was done, we would shake all the silver dollars up and the blindfold would still be securely fastened over your eyes. And I would ask you, would you please pick a quarter or pick a silver dollar? And the probability of you picking the right one is a probability that Jesus coincidentally fulfilled these prophecies. Now, is that a very high probability? Absolutely not. So even from the, the laws of probability, we see that for one man to fulfill these prophecies is an absolute, utter impossibility. That this man had to be who he said he was. All right? Now, here's another interesting statement around the same writer. He said, now these prophecies were either given by inspiration of God or the prophets just wrote them as they thought they should be. In such a case, the prophets had just one chance in 10 to the 17th power of having them come true in any man. But they all came true in Christ. This means that the fulfillment of these eight prophecies, just eight of them, alone proves that God inspired the writing of these prophecies to the definiteness which lacks only one chance in 10 to the 17th power of being absolute. So even though, let's say the guys made it up, what's the possibility of one man fulfilling all those prophecies? It is astronomical, friends, astronomical. John 3, 16, the most famous verse in the Bible tells us, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And this is the good news of, of the gospel. Again, Isaiah 53 mentions how he made his grave with the wicked. And even when he, he died, he didn't even have the proper burial. Someone had to give him a grave and tomb and him be buried in. Now, what you're looking at right now is what Bible expositors have called the gospel of the Old Testament. Some people have said that the Old Testament, you can't teach the gospel from the Old Testament. But friends, the best, one of the best places to go in the entire Bible is the Old Testament. Because if you look at this structure here before you, this was the Hebrew sanctuary. This was the gospel in action for the Old Testament. I don't know if you notice here, but there was one way that people got inside this sanctuary structure. Now this sanctuary was broken up into three distinct parts. Um, the, the part you see where the altar, the fire coming up was called the courtyard. The other part inside was the holy place, and there was another compartment called the most holy place. We'll talk about this more tomorrow. But this was the symbol of Christ in the Old Testament. They would take a lamb, and the lamb would be slain, and that lamb was to represent the perfect, spotless Son of God who was to come in the future. And people had to exercise faith in the shed blood that would represent the Christ who was to come in the near future. And it is an absolutely amazing study. In fact, um, the one way in, even though there's three uh, curtains there, it's very fascinating that Jesus says He is the way, the truth, and the life. There's only one way. There isn't a back door to the sanctuary. There isn't a side door. There's only one entrance. And there was only one way to God. It is through Jesus, according to what the Bible says. And the fascinating part is that when Jesus ascended to heaven, he didn't just go up there and is doing nothing. He's actually officiating over the heavenly sanctuary in heaven. And does the Bible say that? Yes, it does. In Hebrews 8, verse 1 and 2, it says, We have such a high priest who was set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. So this sanctuary that was on earth was a type of what was going on in heaven. Okay, it's very, very important. Um, if you look in Hebrews again, chapter 9, it says, For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are figures of the true, but He went into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. So the earthly sanctuary was just a shadow of the reality in heaven. Okay, now this evening... We're going to look at a very fascinating prophecy, Daniel 8 and 9. And what you see on the screen there, you see a ram with two horns. Now, can someone tell me from last night, what does a beast represent in the Bible? Does anyone remember? 
a kingdom, right? According to Daniel 7, 17 and verse 23. So the Daniel chapter 8 talks about two beasts, okay? One of these beasts happens to be a ram, and the other beast, um, there's another vantage point, of a he-goat that it comes, a ram and a he-goat. Now, if you look in your Bibles, if you open your Bibles now, if you have them before you, and look at Daniel 8, verse 20 and 21, the Bible specifically tells you on which these two kingdoms represent. So we don't have to guess. The Bible says that the first, the ram, was the, the, the kingdom of Medo-Persia, and the goat with one horn was the kingdom of Greece. And what Daniel portrays for us in Daniel chapter 8 is that this goat comes to this ram very fast, doesn't even touch the ground, jumps, leaps, and he slays this ram, and then he stands upon this ram. And the Bible tells us in Daniel 8, verse 8, it says, Therefore the he-goat waxed very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken. Now, if the ram with the two horns, the ram represented Medo-Persia, and the goat represented Greece, who was the great horn of Greece? We talked about him last night. Does anyone remember? Alexander the Great, exactly. So this typifies the, or, or to symbolizes for us the, the force and the speed in which Alexander again took over the world. And then notice what it says after that though. It says when he was strong, when Alexander was strong in other words, the great horn was what? Broken. So at the height of Alexander's reign, he died. And if you look at history, that's exactly what happened because Alexander was 31 years old and he died, he, he drunk too much and he died. And um, fascinating. That's what exactly, again, like what the Bible told us before. And, but it doesn't stop there. And verse, the next verse says, And for it, this big horn, this notable horn, came up, excuse me, the, the, the great horn, came up four notable ones to the four winds of heaven. And again, if you survey the pages of secular history, you will discover that when Alexander died, his kingdom was divided into four parts. Uh, Cassander, Lysimachus, Ptolemy, and Seleucus, these four Macedonian, these four Greek kings, or no, excuse me, not kings, but generals, and it was divided that way. He would have given it to his son, Alexander, but his son was too young at that time to reign. So right there, again, the Bible is amazingly correct. Daniel 8.13 says the following. Then it continues by saying, I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said to that certain saint which spoke, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary, what we looked, about, looked, looked at earlier, and the host to be trodden underfoot? So he was asking a question. How long will this sanctuary be trodden underfoot? How long? And the answer came resoundingly from the angel. And verse 14 tells us, And he said to me, Unto two thousand three hundred years, days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. This is very interesting. Now, which sanctuary was it talking about? Was it talking about the one on earth, or was it talking about the one in heaven? Well, let's see what the Bible tells us in Daniel 8, continuing, verse 17. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid. This was an angel that it was appearing to Daniel. And I fell upon my face, but he said to me, Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the what? The end shall be the vision. So this vision concerned the time of the end. Okay, so this will help us in our understanding on which, part, which sanctuary was it. Now if you go next to the next chapter, Daniel 9, it tells us when Daniel was praying, he says the man Gabriel, if you look, it's the angel Gabriel in the original, came to me in swift flight, and he said to me, O Daniel, I have come out to give you wisdom and understanding. And the reason why he came to give him wisdom and understanding was Daniel had no idea what this dream meant or this vision meant. He was totally confused. So God dispatched an angel to give him a Bible study. Isn't that wonderful? Wouldn't that be great if, if one, one evening you're studying the Bible and you can't understand and God dispatches an angel to share with you what the Bible says? Well, I believe he can still do that. I believe that he can even work through the Holy Spirit and teach you that way. And this is a fascinating uh, statement about this prophecy we're going about to share. 
And the prophecy we're about to share has been deemed controversial by some people. In fact, it has been deemed controversial in the Talmudic law, the Jewish holy book, the Talmud. Um, Notice what it says here. This is a curse that is written in the Talmud about what we're going to study this evening. Very interesting. It says, May the bones of the hands and the bones of the fingers decay and decompose of him who turns the pages of the book of Daniel. That's pretty interesting. To find out the time of Daniel 9, 24 through 27. And may his memory rot from off the face of the earth forever. Now, you would have to admit and agree with me this evening that that is not a very lovely curse, right? I guess there's no such thing as a lovely curse, right? But this is not a a very nice thing to wish on anyone. But I want to ask you a question tonight. Why do you think that a book of the Old Testament and a specific part of the book of Daniel would be cursed by the Jewish religion? Why do you think that might be? Perhaps there's something in this time prophecy of Daniel 9, 24, and 27 that identifies who the true Messiah truly is. And if this information was given to people who are of that belief system, then perhaps they would no longer be a part of that belief system. So this is very serious. Do you want to continue this evening to learn about this prophecy? Because if not, you might be cursed. Do you want to continue? Okay, hey, I'm not afraid of this curse. Let's look at Daniel 9.24 and see what it has to say. It says, 70 weeks are determined upon your people. This is the angel describing to Daniel this prophecy to explain it to him, the one he was confused about. 70 weeks are determined upon your people. Who was Daniel's people? Do you remember? The Jewish nation, exactly. And upon your holy city, which was Jerusalem, to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the Most Holy. This verse is packed with information. Now, this evening we're just going to focus in on a few things and try to work through this. The word determined in the original Hebrew, it means to cut off or separate from. Um, It means to separate, to amputate, exactly. It means to take away, to cut off. And 70 weeks, the Bible says, were determined or cut off for who? Daniel's people, which were the Jews. Make sense so far? Okay. Now, let's probe this a little bit more. In prophecy, we learn that in prophecy, there are symbols in prophecy which stand for something. For example, we talked about this evening that a beast represents a... Kingdom, right? Waters represents multitudes of people, a large area. Also, you'll find in, prof- in the, prophet- in the contextual- contextualness of prophecy that also time can be symbolic depending on your, um, your context. Here we find that in prophecy, one day equals a year. Now, that's a- that sounds nice, but do we have any evidence to back that up? Yes, we do. The Bible tells us in Ezekiel 4, 6, I have appointed you each day for a what? A year. So we see a principle of a day for a year. Numbers tells us the same thing. After the number of the days in which you search the land, even 40 days each day for a year. Now, keep in mind that this doesn't take place all the time in the Bible. Every time you see the word day there does not mean that it was a year, right? For example, when you read Genesis chapter 1, the Bible says, um, in the, then there was light and the, the evening and the morning were the what? The first day. The Bible specifically says that it was an evening and a morning, so we know that it was a 24-hour literal period. Does that make sense? Here we look at 70 weeks times 7. Okay, the Bible says that there was 70 weeks cut off for the Jewish nation. Remember verse 24? So if you do a little math, now I, I know you came this evening not planning on doing math, but I have to bust your bubble tonight. We're going to do a little mathematics, okay? But you all look capable and bright individuals, so it'll be no problem. 70 weeks times 7 equals 490, correct? So we're talking about 490 days, and if we take the day for a year principle, it would be 490 literal years. Now, 
we're going to show you how this all plays out. It's absolutely fascinating. And the question is, what is this prophetic time, this 490 is 70 weeks or 490 literal years, what is it cut off from? It is cut off from, contextually, the big, bigger prophecy of the 2300-day prophecy in Daniel 8.14 or 2300 years. So this prophecy is cut off, amputated from, this larger time frame. So this 2300-year prophecy in Daniel 8.14. So here we have some things to help us, uh, tools to help us get through this. So we have the beginning of the prophecy, 490 years are cut off for the Jews. Now we don't know yet when this begins. Right now it's just out in the air. We don't know, but we will find out in just a moment the starting point. And then after that, at the end of the prophecy, the sanctuary is cleansed. Okay, the sanctuary is cleansed. And we'll talk about in the future which sanctuary it is. So when did these 2300 years begin and end? Again, the prophecy we just looked at, 70 weeks are determined upon your people, Daniel 9, 24. And it continues by saying, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth to the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. Now don't let the scores and the, all that intimidate you. It's very simple when we break it down. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. So let me just back up for just a moment to show you this. So the Bible says quite clearly that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem. So this is the specific time in which this prophecy would begin. It would start when this commandment was issued to restore and to build Jerusalem. Now we're going to find out real quick now when that was. Um, here it tells us this is our starting point to the decree to restore and build Jerusalem. And we go a little bit um, further and it tells us the temple was restored, uh, if you look in verse 24. But this still leaves us 62 weeks of this larger prophecy. Now don't, don't get uh, anxious if you don't ever understand every particular at this juncture, okay? Well, it'll become more clear as we go through this evening. And this would culminate unto the coming of Messiah the Prince, or Jesus, on this earth. And where was this starting point, or when did it take place? Well, if you look in um, your history books, and even in many Bibles, you'll find that it will tell you the, the date in the margin. It says that Artaxerxes I, the king of Persia, issued a decree in 457 B.C. And if you do the math, if you go into the future, 483 years unto Messiah the Prince, you come to the year 27 A.D. And, and some of you may be wondering, well, well, wait a minute, I thought it was 490. Why does it say 483? Well, in the prophecy, in verse 25, it says it would be three score, and, uh, excuse me, let me just go run quickly right back so I don't lose anyone, because this is a little complicated, but once you understand it, it's very simple. Um, it'll be, till Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks, okay, that's seven, and three score and two weeks. Now, in the Bible, Old English, some of your new versions even translate it clearer. And they say that it's um, three score is how many? Sixty. A score stands for twenty. So what we have here is seven plus sixty plus two. So sixty-two plus seven is what? Sixty-nine, right? So sixty-nine prophetic weeks is 483 days, right? or 483 literal years, okay? I know it's a little uh, complicated, but it, it's really not once we unpack it all. So again, the decree to restore and build Jerusalem, the temple would re be restored, and that would lead us to the Messiah, the Prince. And if we do the math, again, like I showed you just a moment ago, that would bring us to the year 27 A.D. 27 A.D., 457 B.C. to 483. Now let's take a look to make sure what I'm talking about is true. Um, because I don't want to just be saying anything here. In the book of Ezra, it tells us when this decree was issued. It says, Artaxerxes, king of kings, unto Ezra the priest, the scribe of the law of the God of heaven, I make a decree that all they of the people of Israel, which are minded of their own free will, to go up to Jerusalem to go with you. Verse 12 and 13. Now verse 21 goes on by saying, 
And I, even I, Artaxerxes, the king, do make a decree to all the treasurers which are beyond the river, that whatsoever Ezra the priest shall require of you, it be done speedily. This was the decree in 457 B.C. that allowed them to restore and build this temple that was destroyed. And uh, there is the, the picture there of the decree being signed, 457 B.C. Now, verse 25 continues this thought, and it says, Until Messiah the Prince, we've already seen this, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So, let's take a look at it it's on the timeline. 457, the decree is given. 27 A.D., the Messiah would come on the scene. Now, does anyone here, any, any of you Bible scholars here this evening, do you know what the word Messiah means in the original language, the Greek? Does, some of you may know who studied the Bible. Exactly, you're exactly right. It means the anointed. The word Messiah means the anointed one. And the question we want to ask ourselves is, when was Jesus anointed or baptized? Because Daniel 9 says the Messiah would come at the end of this time period. Let's find out from the Bible itself. It tells us here in Luke, Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also, being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened. The Bible tells us that in Luke chapter 3, verses 1 and 21. So what year of Tiberius Caesar was it? 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. Now, it's amazing that that is exactly what took place in history. The 15th year of Tiberius Caesar was exactly 27 A.D. In fact, I want to show you something that I just dug up recently. The reign of Tiberius Caesar tells, and this historical statement here says, in the year 12 A.D., Tiberius Caesar was granted supreme power from Augustus Caesar. So exactly what the Bible said. He came right on time. And that is why they, God took the, the liberty to inspire Luke to write exactly in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, then Jesus would be anointed. Now, when was Jesus anointed? Let's take a look at what the Bible says. And the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased. Okay, it's talking about his baptism. And notice what Jesus said when he was baptized. This is incredible. He said, the time is what? Fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Now, which time do you think Jesus was speaking of here? What time do you think it was? According to what we've looked at this evening. It had to be the fulfillment of those 70 or that 69th week. Okay? Now, I want you to take with me your Bibles for a moment. I want to grab my own Bible down here. And I want for you to open your own Bible. If you don't have a Bible, there's Bibles at the back. I'm sure if you, someone could bring you one if you don't have a Bible. Um, I want you to turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 1. The Gospel of John, chapter 1. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And um, this is a very, very interesting um, context. Okay, John chapter 1, and we'll be starting from verse 35 of uh, John chapter 1. And the Bible tells us, Again the next day, after John stood and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, they said, Behold the Lamb of God. This was, of course, referring to Christ. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Verse 38, Then Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? Why are you seeking me? And they said to him, What did they say to him? Do you see what it says? Rabbi. Now, the word rabbi means teacher. It means teacher. It doesn't have any significant divine connotations to it. All the different teachers in the Jewish land uh, that taught Judaism were called rabbi. It was a respectful name, but it wasn't a divine name. It didn't, it didn't uh, show divinity of any sort. So they called Jesus here rabbi, teacher, and they asked him, um, where do you dwell? Where, where do you live? And verse 39, he said to them, come and see. So they came and they saw where he dwelt 
and they abode with him that day, for, he, for it was about the tenth hour. Now verse 40, one of the two which heard John speak followed him, which was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Now, okay, first of all, I want you to get in your mind. There's these two disciples, right? Jesus, they come to Jesus and they say, Jesus, we want to see where you live. We want to see where you stay. And he says, okay, come and see. So he comes and he spends some time with these, uh, these disciples and they, Jesus shows him where he was dwelling at the time. And verse 40, and it says, one of the two which heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. And he first found his own brother, Simon, and he said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. Now, I want you to think for just a moment. First, what did he call Jesus before he spent the time with him? Rabbi. He called him teacher, right? After he spends time with Jesus, what does he say at that juncture? He calls him what? Messiah, the Christ. And if you look in this time frame, the other Gospels, this was the time of after his baptism. This is the time when the prophecy was fulfilled. So when I read this, even though the Bible doesn't say it here, this is my own sanctified speculation, if you will. But it seems to me that Jesus must have somehow shown these disciples that he was indeed the Messiah. Um, it's, it's, it's a very fascinating passage of Scripture because immediately after that, he said, this is the Christ. Very, very interesting. Now, John 1, 29, we just read this. Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Let me put my Bible back here. And the Bible tells us exactly when God anointed Jesus. It says, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. So according to the Bible, Jesus was anointed when? At his baptism. When Jesus was baptized, that's when he was anointed. And the book of Galatians, through the writings of Paul, he said, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son. So let me ask you a, a, a question tonight. Can there be more than one true Messiah? Can there be more than one? Can there be two or three? Can there be five, ten, twenty? No. There can only be one true Messiah because only one fulfilled these prophecies. There's only one that did it. No one else fulfilled these prophecies. Well, what happened in the 70th week, okay? And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be what? Cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and the end of the war's desolations are determined. Okay, we're going to talk about what that means to be cut off, but let's first look at verse 27. Then the Messiah shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he will bring an end to sacrifice and offering. Okay, we have some clues. First of all, the Bible says that this Messiah would be cut off somehow. And when he would be cut off, he would put an end to what? The sacrifices and the offerings. Okay, keep that in mind. Keep that firmly etched in your mind. So we have this 70-week time period. There is one prophetic week or seven literal years left in the prophecy. So, so far, let me review quickly for you. The prophecy began in 457 B.C. when this decree of Artaxerxes was signed. And we go into the future 69 weeks or 483 prophetic days or 483 literal years. And it brings us to the year, remember the year? Do you remember? 27 A.D. And it said, what happened in 27 A.D.? The Christ was baptized. He was anointed. But still, we have one more week left in the prophecy, right? Because it was a 70-week prophecy. Does that make sense? So we still have one more week, and this is what we're going to discuss for the remainder of our lecture tonight. There is one prophetic week or seven literal years left in the prophecy. And what is half of seven? Three and a half. Very, very simple. Three and a half years from the fall of 27 A.D., if we march from three and a half years from then, will lead us to 31 A.D. And some of you may be wondering, well, wait a minute, how is that possible? Because Jesus was born on December 25th. Jesus was born on December 25th because that's when we celebrate Christmas. But it's very fascinating if you really study this out that you will discover that December 25th was actually 
not the birthday of Jesus. Because I'll give you many lines of reasons, but this is the, probably the most prominent. When you read the Gospels, the Bible says that when Jesus was born, where were the shepherds at? They were outside, right? And in Palestine in December, it's very, very frigid around that time of year. So historically, we can also see that Jesus had to be born sometime in the fall of 27 AD. Now, does that mean if you celebrate Christ Christmas that you're a terrible individual? Absolutely not. We can use, I believe Christmas is a great time to share Jesus with others. Um, so we have half of seven, there's three and a half, and it leads us to the spring of 31 AD. So again, let me r review for you, because the more you review this in your mind, the more it will solidify and you will understand it and teach it to someone else. 457 BC, the decree was given. We go into the future 483 years to the baptism of Christ in 27 AD. And then notice what verse 26 says. We've read it. We'll read it again. That Messiah would be cut off, but not for himself. If you have your Bible, I'd like for you to turn with me to Isaiah 53, uh, the Old Testament book of Isaiah, it's um, quite a large book. Isaiah 53 and verse 8. And notice with me what, this, what the Bible says. Isaiah 53 and verse 8. Perhaps I'll grab my, my sword once again. Isaiah 53 and verse 8. And um, this is known as one of the most, um, even though we didn't have a chance to really exhaust this tonight, is a beautiful chapter on the Messiah. It is absolutely beautiful. In fact, um, if you enjoy memorizing Bible, this is a great chapter to do so. Isaiah 53. Notice with me what verse 8 has to say. Speaking of the Messiah, it says, He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. So according to the, what God's word says, how was Jesus cut off biblically? How was he cut off according to this? Through the crucifixion, correct? That's how it took place. So the Bible says that he was crucified. He was cut off in the middle of that week. So Christ was crucified exactly on time. You know, if you study the life of Jesus, you'll find that Jesus wasn't a haphazard individual but he did everything precisely in a systematic, organized way because that's the way he was. That's how his character was. Um, so let's take a look again at the extended uh, prophecy. Uh, again, 457 B.C., the original decree was sent forth. The baptism took place. 27 A.D., he was anointed just on, right on time. And in the midst of that week, he was cut off, the Bible says. And he was cut off by the death of the cross exactly on time, 31 A.D. And here we have another vantage point. And if you, if you take your Bible and you read the Gospels and you compute this time frame and you add up all the dates that are given there, you will come to three and a half years of earthly ministry. And um, the Bible confirms itself. It's absolutely, there's no other book like it. So he's cut off for himself. And according to the prophecies of Daniel, God's covenant with the Jews would cease in 34 AD, and I'll, I'll show you that in just a moment. Um, as you know, when you read, if you've read the Bible at all, and perhaps some of you have not read the Bible, but when you read it, you'll discover that when the gospel was first proclaimed after Jesus rose from the dead, do you remember who the gospel went to first before anyone else? The Jewish nation, that's right. They went to the Jewish nation. So God sent his message first to the lost sheep of the house of Israel before he took it to the Gentile world. And um, like I said before, that when Jesus was on earth, many of the Jewish leaders, many of the Jews, many of those who thought Jesus was the Messiah, they misunderstood the prophecies. They thought that Jesus was coming to set up his kingdom on earth instead of setting up a heavenly kingdom. Friends, do you think it might be possible that in the days in which we live, that today people also are misunderstanding the prophecies about the end of time? Do you think it might be possible that much of the religious world and Christian world may not be on point with actually what the Bible teaches in its, in its true nature? Well, we'll be trying to, to show you that from night to night. Um, Hosea 11 verse 4 uh, speaks about the compassion that Jesus had for the Jewish nation. 
And in Hosea 11, it tells us, I led them with cords of compassion, with the bands of love, and I bent down to them and I fed them. So was Jesus patient with his erring people? Yes or no? Very patient. He didn't cast them off aside, but he lovingly gave them warning after warning and and message after message of of hope. Hosea 11, uh, verse 8, a few verses later, says the following, How can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? So it wasn't God, he didn't want to do this, but as the Bible says, he, he ended up having to do it. And Luke 11, as Jesus looked and surveyed the beautiful city of Jerusalem, the Bible tells us he wept when he thought of the people there that would not accept the beautiful saving message he had to give. The Bible says in verse um, Luke 19, And as he approached Jerusalem and he saw the city, he wept over it. And he said, Even if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. Here he was speaking to the Jewish nation there, people living in Jerusalem. And he says, The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. Quite striking. Jesus says some very straight things. They will not leave one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. The question is, friends, did this actually take place? Absolutely. In 70 AD, the the temple was destroyed, and history tells us that as it was destroyed, the the Roman soldiers threw the firebrands into the temple, and as it caught on fire, as it it was blazing inside, the the, the sanctuary um, furniture there, the, the gold that was there, melted because of the high heat, and the gold came in between the cracks because the stones were huge. They were gargantuan in size. And the gold melted and it came through the cracks and it ended up solidifying there. And the soldiers actually picked apart these huge granite blocks to get to the gold. I mean, and Jesus here tells us all that this is exactly what happened. This was many years, actually 39 years beforehand that Jesus said these words. So let's again look at our little chart here. Uh, we've seen the decree in 457, the baptism in 27 AD, the cross, and then the gospel would be proclaimed to the Gentiles after this three and a half year period was finished. Because beforehand, the gospel was not prohibited to be preached to the Gentiles. It was only to the Jewish nation because those, those were the ones to hear the good news first. So the Bible tells us candidly, in the midst of the week, Christ, the Messiah, would cause the sacrifice to cease. Uh, These verses also tell us that the Messiah would die by crucifixion on the 14th day of the first Jewish month in the year AD 31. And these predictions have been fulfilled in every detail. So this is quite amazing. And as the people surveyed the cross on that fateful day, the question arose and the question happened, What took place immediately when Jesus died on the cross? Does anyone remember, have read the Bible maybe as a child, when when Jesus died on the cross, something significant took place in the earthly sanctuary? Does anyone remember what it was? You don't, they took exactly, they ripped that veil, right? Notice what it says in Mark 15. Actually, excuse me, let me correct that. They didn't mark it. God himself ripped the veil. And Mark 15, 38 says, And the veil of the temple was rent or split in two, or in twain, which means in two, from the top to the bottom. Now this wasn't a veil like the curtains you see here in this hall. Not very, they weren't thin. They were about the size of a man's hand. And they were very high. They were like 15 feet high. So there was no possible way that a man could get up there and you know, cut that veil. It had to come from God himself. And that veil was split from top to bottom, signifying to the Jewish nation that the giving of sacrifices and offerings had come to an end. That system had come to an end. Now Jesus Christ was the consummate sacrifice. He was the one that fulfilled those sacrifices. Very, very fascinating how all these things played out. And the good news is also that we don't have to go to any individual to pray to God today. Did you know that? We don't have to go to a a, a pastor or priest. 
we can go straight to God Himself in our bedroom, on our knees, praying and talking to Him as a friend. That's what we can do, friends. We don't have to, to do anything out of the ordinary. We can just talk to Him like we talk to our best friend. Matthew tells us the very same thing, and it says, And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And this is how the sacrifices would cease, as we saw in Daniel. So according to the prophecies of Daniel, God's covenant with the Jews would cease in 34 A.D. And in 34 A.D., something very significant took place. If you have your Bible, maybe this evening, when you get home, you can read Acts chapter 7. And what you'll find in Acts chapter 7 was a very powerful sermon by the first Christian martyr after Jesus himself by the name of Stephen. Stephen here was preaching to the religious leaders and telling them a very strong message. He was telling those people that you actually killed the predicted Messiah of the Old Testament. Now, do you think that message was appreciated very much by those sitting there? <laughs> Absolutely not. The Bible tells us that when they heard those words... They were cut to the heart and they gnashed with their teeth and they picked up stones to stone him. Now this is interesting. If you read later on when you get home or some other time, Acts chapter 2, you will see the same phraseology of being cut to the heart. When Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, they were cut to the heart, but what did they do? Does anyone remember? They were cut to the heart and they said, what must we do to be what? Saved, okay? They were cut to the heart and they said, what, can, what must we do to be saved? We want to be saved. But in Acts chapter 7, a totally different reaction was shown. They were cut to the heart and what did they do? They picked up stones to stone the messenger. And that's still happening today. Some people, when they hear this message, they embrace it and they love the truth as it is in Jesus. Some people don't like it and they want to kill the messenger. Still the same thing today. So, oh, I didn't even read that. Let me read it for you. It says in AD 34... Stephen, the first Christian martyr, was stoned. The Jewish leaders as a nation rejected the gospel and it went to the Gentiles. Now, does that mean that any person of Jewish lineage today cannot be saved? Is that what that's saying? Absolutely not. But the, the nation, the Jewish nation of special favor of just specifically that nation, God can favor any. He, he still favors Israel, but Israel is now a little bit different, as I will show you in just a moment what the Bible teaches on that. So here are the predictions of the Messiah in a bird's eye view what we've looked at tonight. The first, the decree again was given way back in 457 B.C. We would go into the future 483 years to the year 27 A.D. when Jesus himself was anointed at his baptism. The Bible says that he would be cut off in the middle of that last week for the sins of the people, 31 A.D. And then in 34 A.D., the gospel would be proclaimed to the Gentiles at that time. And it wasn't proclaimed before, but only after, after that time. The Bible tells us in Galatians 3, verse 29, if you belong to who? To Christ, then you are whose seed? Abraham's seed. Now, when the, Jew, the Jewish leaders of Jesus' day, what did, they, what did they boast about? They said, we are Abraham's seed. So what they were saying is, we are Abraham's seed, we are, Jew, we are from the Jewish lineage, and we're going to go to heaven no matter what. But when Jesus came, he said, if you belong to me, you are Abraham's seed. So friends, tonight, if you believe in your heart that Jesus is the Christ, and you've asked him to come into your heart, you are part of Abraham's seed by faith. And the last part of the verse says, and you are heirs according to the promise. Beautiful truth in the Bible. And in Galatians 3, in the same uh, chapter, a little bit before, it says, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is a new creation. Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, even to the Israel of God. So if you've accepted Jesus Christ, you are part of spiritual Israel. Now, before we close, I want to invite you again to pick up your Bible. And we're going to look at this last, um, well, we just have just a little bit more here. But this um, last chapter of the book of Luke, you'll find that in the Gospels, of course, Matthew, Mark, Luke, the third book of the New Testament. 
Luke chapter 24, and we'll be starting from verse 24, the same verse number as the chapter. And this is a, I'll give you a little historical background about this. At this time, the disciples were very discouraged because they believed that Jesus, he said he was the Messiah, that he would set up a kingdom on this earth, but they were crushed when Jesus was actually killed. They weren't expecting that to take place. So they were, they were very devastated by this, and there was two disciples who were coming back from Jerusalem to a town called Emmaus, and they were very discouraged. They were very saddened by this turn of events. And as they were walking discouraged, in a discouraged manner back to their hometown of Emmaus, we pick it up from verse 24. And it says, And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it, even so the women said, but they saw him not. Verse um, 25, and it says, Then he said to them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. This is Jesus talking to these discouraged men about his death. Verse 26, Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And verse 27 says, And beginning at who? Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in the scriptures the things concerning himself. So what Jesus did was he took the Old Testament and he proved through the pages of the Old Testament that he was the Messiah. He didn't sing and dance. He didn't do anything special. He just gave them a, a Bible study showing them that he was the true Messiah. I'll pick it up from verse 28. And they drew nigh to the village where they went, and he made as though he would have gone further, verse 29, but they constrained him, saying, Please abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in and spent, and spent time with them, and he tarried with them, verse 30. And it came to pass, as he sat to eat with them, he took bread and blessed it, and he broke it and gave it to them. Verse 31, And their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. The last verse here, verse 32. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? Jesus gave them a Bible study to prove he was the Messiah. He didn't um, do some miraculous thing. He just gave them a Bible study. And today, friends, we should base the Messiah, the Jesus Messiahship not on miracles, because miracles can deceive us. In fact, if you read in your Bibles, Revelation 16 and verse 14, it tells us that in the last days that the devil, the, the fallen angels and the devil would even do miracles too. So we must not use miracles solely as a criteria of truthfulness. Um, this is why Jesus says in John 5, 39, Search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Jesus told us that the Scriptures testify of Himself. And we, have we not seen that this evening? The Old Testament prophecies, how they point toward Jesus. So in hindsight, as we finish this lecture this evening, again, let me remind you of the three alternatives. There's only three alternatives regarding this man, Jesus Christ. The first one is Jesus was a liar. The second, Jesus was a lunatic. And the last one, Jesus is the Lord. And this one here, to me, is very compelling line of evidence, to me personally, that Jesus was not lying whatsoever. How many of you have read about the disciples after Jesus uh, died, uh, when he went to heaven? The disciples, does, does anyone know how many disciples died at the hand of a martyr, uh, being killed for their faith? Does anyone remember how many disciples? You can read it in history books. It'll tell you that, that actually there was one disciple who killed himself, Judas, right? There was another disciple named John who wrote the book of Revelation who did not die a martyr's death, but the others did die a martyr's death. They died for their faith. Now, let's suppose, just for a moment, that you knew you were close to Jesus and you knew that G Jesus was a liar, right? Let's just suppose he was a liar. You knew that he was a liar and you were one of his disciples. What are the odds of you dying for someone that you knew was lying? 
Is there any odds for a rational person to do that? To die for someone that you knew was telling the, a lie from the beginning? No way, right? So the, the testimony of the ten um, martyrs of Jesus is compelling evidence that Jesus was a man of truth, that he did not tell a lie about his authenticity. And this last um, paragraph, or these last paragraphs here, talk about this very interesting statement I came across, talking about the, the, the argument that Jesus was just a lunatic. Okay, let me just read this to you. It says, a measure of your insanity... This is kind of deep, so you have to think a little. This is pretty, I like this statement. A measure of your insanity is the size of the gap between what you think you are and what you really are. If I think I am the greatest philosopher in America, I am only an arrogant fool. If I think I am Napoleon, I am probably over the edge. If I think I am a butterfly, I am fully embarked from the sunny shores of sanity. But if I think I am God, I am even more insane because the gap between anything finite, which is earthly, and infinite, which is godly, is even greater. The, excuse me, let me read it again. Gap between anything finite and anything infinite, the infinite God, is even greater than the gap between any two finite things. Isn't that true if you think about it for just a moment? Even a man and a butterfly. Well then, why was, was, why was Jesus not a liar or a lunatic? Almost no one who has read the Gospels, which is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, can honestly consider that option. The attractiveness of Jesus emerge from the Gospels with unavoidable force to any but the most hardened and prejudiced reader. No one who knows both the Gospels and human beings can seriously entertain the possibility that Jesus was a liar or a lunatic, a bad man. There is no way that you can rationally say that. So in the final analysis, we are only brought with one conclusion. There's only one logical answer. And that answer simply is this, is that Jesus Christ is the Lord. There's no other way around it, friends. Jesus is the only one, if you look at historically, uh, uh, the, the laws of probability, prophetically, there is no other Messiah but one Messiah. And right now, it may not seem that this issue that I'm talking about this evening is very ultra-relevant, but in the very near future, I believe this is going to be a very important issue in the world at which we live in, because there's only one way to heaven, not 1,600, not 3,000, only one way, and that's Jesus Christ. Thank you for coming this evening. Please come tomorrow night. The topic tomorrow, as you see on your handout, is entitled The Eternal Guide Zones. Drive safely as you travel home. Thank you.